Praise the Lord. Shall we rise up, please? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for another great opportunity for us to open the pages of scriptures once again. This is a word you have given us. Number one, for ourselves, that we may discover the way of life and the way to life. And that we may know how we are to order our steps and so we can get to heaven. Number two, you've given us the word so we can help multitudes of people and focus their attention on you and direct them on how they will get to heaven. Lord, we pray this double purpose for ourselves and for the men and the women we lead. The double purpose will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray the strength of character, the strength of conviction, the strength of courage that is needed to follow the word line upon line, precept upon precept, without fear, without favor. Without sparing the favorites. And without be becoming unfaithful. Lord we pray you grant every one of us in Jesus name. That this word will be our guide. Will direct us in every decision. And in every scene, every step we take. That this word will guide us. In everything we do, in our personal lives, in our ministerial lives. We're asking, O oh Lord, as we take this word, and we have the grace to live by it, and the grace to enforce it in the ministry. We're asking, O oh Lord, both us and the people who listen to us will get to heaven at last. We pray, Lord, will not be tired, weak, or weary. But this word will be strength, energy, food for every one of us. Open our eyes once again as we look at this word at this time. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me an amen that will wake the sleepers up. Thank you very much. You can sit down. Now we come to one of the great, great things in ministry. This is what divides the boys from the men. This is what divides the preachers from the pastors. This is what divides the conquerors from just the soldiers. This is what divides the people that have no backbone, the jellyfish, from the men of stamina, the men of stress, and the men of purpose, and the men that have a real calling. You know, in the church, as a pastor, as a leader, as an overseer, as a superintendent, there are many things we do. We teach. By now, almost everybody should be able to do that. We preach. Almost everybody should be able to do that by now. After all these many years, we pray. Everybody should be able to do that. But it's a section of the ministry. There is an area of ministry that takes the courage and the boldness of a minister, of a man appointed of God, approved of God, anointed of God. And we come to that very thing right now. Why is it that some churches that have the doctrine and preach the doctrine 
And yet you find in those churches that the life is not right. You find in those churches that although the doctrine is there, teachers are there, preachers are there, ministers are there, prayer warriors are there. And as you listen to them preach, either on Sunday or during the week, everything is online, every I dotted, every T crossed, every punctuation mark is there. But you look at that church where the teaching is there, and yet you cannot find the result of the teaching. Why? That's what we are coming to now. What divides the boys from the men? The people who are really called of God, and they are able and willing to stand up to what the Lord has called them to. And they are able to not only preach, not only inform, but enforce the teaching. If you just inform the people, if you just inspire the people, but you do not have the mind, the heart, the courage to enforce the teaching, the teaching will be there. Human nature is very strong. Walking against the teaching of the word of God. It is the minister that tries his up. And he says, I'm not just to inform your mind. I'm not just to inspire your spirit. I'm here to enforce the scripture. Those are the people that make a difference in the world of ministry. And you can tell. That as we look at our churches, the various locations everywhere, and the Bible study comes to all the deeper life churches by and large nowadays. The same teaching coming from the source is coming to everybody. And yet, as we look at all those churches, even though we're eating from the same source, we're eating from the same plate. And we're dining around the same table. And we're fed on the same doctrine. Yet you find that as you look at all the churches one by one, there is a difference. Some are strong. Some are weak. Eating the same food. Some are courageous. Others are cowardly. And we're eating the same food. Some are separated from the world. Others are married to the world. And we're hearing the same thing. What is the difference? The difference is this. There are ministers that cannot enforce the word. And say, this is the teaching. This is the word. This is the doctrine. It has come to us from the very source. And we know by God's approval, by God's appointment and anointing, this is it. There's no other way. And when a minister in the local church, an overseer in the state or the region, although he can preach, but when people do not follow that word, he said, it's in your hand. I've told you, I've taught you, if you don't take it, it's in your hand. He cannot enforce it. And if he finds an Achan in a congregation, he finds an Achan in the ministry, he finds an Achan in any section of the work, he turns his eyes away. I will act as if I don't see them. He'll say, you are in the hands of God. God will deal with you. Uh -uh. With all this that our Father and the Lord is preaching. With everything that is coming from the headquarters. If anybody does not, I, I, I leave you to God. Joshua did not leave Achan to God. You enforce it. And you say, this is the word. This is the ministry. This is deeper life. Bible church. 
And this is what the Lord has given to us. We're not just preaching it. If you seek, we're just going to come and inform you. No. That's not, that's not the end of our ministry. We inform, we enforce that word. And we say, this is the way. Walk ye in it. And then we supervise you. We look at you. And we find out, are you walking in it? And if you happen to be a bad egg in the basket, a rotting egg in the basket, a, an acorn that will corrupt the whole system, will do something about it. That is what makes a minister. But you know, those who just preach, and they say, I've declared unto you the whole counsel of God. I am pure from the blood of all men. And the church is in a mess. And false doctrine is coming in. And false attitude is coming in. And sinful behavior is coming in. I have done my part. I have preached you the whole counsel of God. Stand up and enforce the word. What will happen to a captain of an army if he gave instruction to the soldiers and then the soldiers went the other direction and then the captain said, I have given all the commands, all the instruction I ought to give. The rest is in your hand, soldiers. They'll fire that kind of captain. Look at our country here. All that were reading the papers, all those people that are elected into office, and then they begin to examine them. This governor here, this governor here. Don't you know it takes courage for the president of a country to stand his ground? Sometimes, even when the judiciary, when they say, that the president doesn't have a right to get that governor out of his seat. The president will still go on. The judiciary is talking. The papers are talking. The senate is talking. And all those people, they are talking. You don't have a right. But the president says, See the corruption. In January, I was with the president of our country. I went to Abuja for um, for uh, this uh, for their crusade, and then I was invited to the state house to just come and have some fellowship with them. And the president was there, and uh, you know many other people, all these you know big ministers were there for that morning devotion. And then I was uh, given the chance to give a short message for the encouragement of, you know, the people there with our president. When we finished, the president will not allow me to just go like that. I said, we need to talk. I said, yes, I will talk. And uh, eventually, he, after he seen, he saw the, you know, the governor of River State. He was, uh, you know, he came that morning to see the president. And after he had finished with him, he saw the minister of steel and industry. And I saw the, uh, you know, the, the man on top, uh, Charles, that's the one in, you know, in a CBN, Central Bank of Nigeria. After they've done all they needed to do, then the president, you know, got me into an office privately. And then we began to discuss. I began to talk about courage, conviction. And then we began, I then began to remind him of Winston Churchill. And how Winston Churchill took his turn. And this is what he did. And he also he replied me. said, you know Winston Churchill. He told me some history of Winston. I told him what I knew. He told me what he, I said. That is it. And he said, he doesn't care for bad name. He said, do you see all those things there? Right? I said, yes sir. Your excellency, I can see. But he said, but whatever will happen. And I was surprised. Whatever will happen. Whatever they will say. He said, this corruption. 
that has gone into the vein, into the blood system of this nation. This time he is there. He'll do his best. Wipe the thing out. And I knew, I knew something was coming from our discussion. I knew something was coming for this governor, that governor. I knew something was coming on the way. And he began to pick them since January last year until this time. He began to pick them one by one. You read the papers. Now, if the president of our country can be that bold and strong, and he's saying this thing, we have told them, he told me, we told them, he said, now it's not the time of telling. We've done enough telling, we will enforce it. Now, if in politics we can find somebody that will say we're going to wipe out corruption in the church, in the state, in the region, at the headquarters of Deep Alive Bible Church, are we just going to say we have taught them whatever they do? Whatever they don't do is in their hand. Not here. We'll teach you. We'll train you. We'll toughen your mind. That you will know. If you're going to be a minister, here is what it takes. That's why we're coming to this passage tonight. Are you still awake? Yeah. You know, and some topics are better taught in the morning before you eat. When you are when you are hungry, and hunger will not allow you to sleep. But you know what? You have listened to all these other messages, and you have prayed, and you have cried, and you have made your decisions. And then I come. Why did they put me on this last hour? I think uh, maybe I'll change it. This thing later. Ah, you see you now. Praise the Lord. Well, if you are awake, then I can continue. Yes. Are you still awake? Yes. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And you know, sometimes when you frown when I'm preaching, I think you don't love me. But when you laugh, then I think, these people, I was thinking they didn't love me. I didn't know that you loved me this much. That even though the time is going, you're still willing to listen to me. Are you alright? Yes. As I am alright. Yes. Now we come to Joshua. Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 7, remember what the Lord had said. In Joshua chapter 7, I'm reading to you from verse 12. Joshua chapter 7. We're reading from verse 12. You know the background story already. In Joshua chapter 7, verse 12. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before the enemies because they were they were cursed neither will i be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed thing from among you up sanctify the people and say sanctify yourselves against tomorrow for thus says the lord god of israel there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until thou take away the accursed thing from among you. In the morning, therefore, ye shall, ye shall be brought according to your tribes. And it shall be that, that, that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to the families thereof and the family which the lord take which the lord shall take shall come by households and the household which the lord shall take shall come man by man and it shall be that he which is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire he and all that he has because he has transgressed the covenant of the lord and because he has wrought fully in israel the lord directed that they must discover the transgressor and he must deal with the transgressor 
and it's after that, after dealing with the transgressor, that now the presence of God will come back. And the mighty working power of God will come back to them again. And then they will move on. And they will be able to possess the land and the break in fellowship. The break in the interaction and relationship. All that will be mended again. There will be a bridge that is built once again. And then we can go over the bridge and go and possess the land. Recovery and restoration to divine favor. Here is the process. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, discovery of the transgressor in Israel. The discovery of the transgressor in Israel. Number two, disclosure by the transgressor in Israel. The disclosure. That means now he opened up. He confessed, although it was too late. He disclosed what he had done. The disclosure by the transgressor in Israel. Number three, discipline of the troubler of Israel. The discipline of the troubler of Israel. The discipline of the troubler in Israel. Number one, discovery. The discovery of the transgressor in Israel. Have you noticed something here? You, you need, we need to study the Bible. To discover Achan. What method did they use? Understand. This was the time before the time of the prophets. And this is very important for us. In discovering what Achan had done. They will take the tribes one by one. They are told for them. And then they'll pray. And they'll seek the face of the Lord. And the Lord will say, the person is from this tribe. All the other 11 tribes, you can go. Then they will take this tribe. The tribe of Judah. They'll bring all the families by name. Look at the process. And then God will say, it is this family. All the other families, you're through. You can go. Then they'll take that family, man by man. And then they will test again and ask the Lord again. Long process before the time of the prophets. And then after that, they were able to pinpoint the individual that had done the thing. Look at Joshua chapter 7, verse 16. So Joshua rose up, rose up early in the morning. Please notice that. Difficult assignment was to be done. And yet it was a necessary assignment. There are people who are fast in preaching. There are people who are fast in teaching. There are people who are very quick in ministry. But they are very, very slow in discipline. It's not just part of them. It's not part of their nature. They would rather the accursed sin remains there and then the children of Israel, they are dying. That is okay for them. They would rather have the accursed sin there, not deal with it and still turning it about in their mind. What will I do? How will I handle this? What will the relatives of the man say? What will his friends feel? How will it affect the church? What will they think at this early stage of my ministry? And we're just going in into the land. How will they see me? How will they view me? What attitude will they have towards me? Will they say, ah, look at this one. He has just come. How many weeks have we sent, have spent together? How many weeks has he been in leadership? And he has started, look at his turn approach. It's difficult approach. Ah, if this is the way you are going to do it, we will be ready for you too. If that is the hand you are going to bring up early in the ministry, we too will be ready for you. They'll be thinking, they'll say, if they say like that to me, how will I get through? They don't try so early to enforce the word and to have the discipline. And so the church becomes corrupted 
But in the case of Joshua, you know, this is how you know a man that is called of God. This is how you know a man whose heart is in the Lord. He doesn't worry what you think about him. What you say about him. That's a real minister. That's a man called of God. And those are the people that can preserve this legacy, this heritage that the Lord has given us. In verse 16, so Joshua rose up early in the morning and brought Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah and he took the family of Zahites. And he brought the family of the Zahites, man by man. And Zabdi was taken. And he brought his household, man by man. And Achan, the son of Kamil, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Eventually, they narrowed each down. To the single man that had done the thing, Achan. But look at the process. But you know, that process is very long. It's not the process of the past of the prophet. And you know, they had not been baptized in the Holy Ghost. And you know that the prophets had not risen at that time. This even the time before the time of the judges. But he gave some apostles, he gave some prophets. Some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. Until we all come in the unity of the faith unto a perfect man. So, the time of the prophets had not come. That's why they had to go through all that long process. Now, at the time of the prophets, how did they find out the transgressor for Samuel? Chapter 15. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, we're reading from verse 13. 1 Samuel 15, reading from verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Now you can't tell a prophet that. You don't need to tell the prophet that the prophet will know. Here is the time of the prophets. And the prophet does not have to now go through family after family, tribe after tribe, man after man. It comes straight to him. And then we're told that Samuel said in verse 14, What meaneth then this bleaching of the sheep that in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. Oh, and Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. You can't tell a prophet that. It will read in between the lines. And it will see below the words. And it will know the details. And once again, let me remind you, it doesn't have to go tribe after tribe making a selection. And family after family making a selection. Man after man before he discovers this thing comes through directly to the, for the person having the prophetic ministry. Verse 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. That's it. That's the prophet. He found him out. The discovery of the transgressor in Israel. Verse 17. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, 
and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. He was discovered. He was discovered. This is a prophet, Samuel. It's different from Joshua. There's a higher revelation now. And detecting them, you, you don't need an interview with a prophet. And it, a, a prophet does not have to go through interview upon interview upon interview before he discovers that this man, this king, he had done wrong. In verse 20, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. You see how he's, how he's trying to pretend? To cover up? To make excuses? I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And I've gone the way which the Lord sent me. And I've brought Agag, the king of Amalek. And I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, he shifted the blame on the people. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice. And it's going to excuse them. It's going to excuse them to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Now, in leadership, can you look up here? If the leader, the pastor, is doctrine-oriented, and somebody very close to him, maybe a group coordinator, maybe another worker, but very close to him, that they work together, that's good. They unite together and always reason that that's all right. But if that other person walking along with him, he is not doctrine oriented, he's people oriented. Soft spot for people. Always excusing people. Although the pastor, the leader, the overseer may be strong in doctrine. And let to him alone. He knows what to do. But his right hand man is people oriented. And he will always say, yes, pastor. But you know these people, the reason actually why they will excuse everything. Until you cannot lay your hand on this. Because the man, his right hand man, is not strong in doctrine. It's only strong in people management, psychological sentiment, excusing everything, excusing everybody. And then because of his explanation, because you see the pastor cannot be everywhere. And his right hand people are his eyes. And once they come back to him and they say, Pastor, is true, this happened. But, they bring in now, their people leaning towards just excusing everybody. Then that pastor, if he does not have the spirit of God, if he does not have a mind of his own, he's never going to be able to take any decision. Because, on what basis will he take decision? He just water down everything, excuse everything. That's the reason why if you're a pastor, if you're a minister, if you're a group coordinator, if you're an overseer, if you're a coordinator, you need to have a mind of your own. You need to be strong on the watch of God so that, yes, you allow people to talk. Yes, they talk, but you size them up. You measure them. Is this person talking to me? Is he concerned? For the doctrine of the Bible. No. Is he concerned for the glory of God? No. Is he concerned to ma for maintaining the standard? Is he concerned to 
earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. No, it's people oriented. And they will always excuse the people. Very dangerous. And so you find Saul here saying, but uh, yes, this is what the people did, but I can give you the reason why they did it. Excusing them. And then Samuel said, in verse 22, as the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected thee from being king. That's a prophet. Not only that he discovered the backsliding, the disobedience, the rebellion, he had a heart, a mind, the courage, and the conviction to be able to tell the king to say, now you have lost your kingdom. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, what I'm pointing out here is the method of the prophet. We don't have to follow the method of Joshua. We've come a long way from the time of Joshua. Tribe after tribe, family after family, man after man, before we eventually discover Josh, uh, Achan. That's a long process. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 1. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. And he came unto him, and he said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich, and the other poor. Then he told him the parable. And then David responded to that parable. Look at verse 7. And Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. Do you see direct? He knew it. It was revelation. This is the time of the prophets that now he knew. And he said, Thou art the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I noted thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul, and I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore, as thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight, thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and has slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house, because thou hast despised me, and thou hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. See, Nathan, that's a prophet. That's a prophet. Not only to inform David, that what you have done is wrong. But to let David know, this is going to be the consequence of what you have done. You have used the sword and you have killed. The sword will never depart out of your house. Oh, you say, but God forgave him. But God forgave him. Hmm. But God forgave him. Yes, I know. But God forgave him. You need to come to the next chapter. There's no time. God forgave him. I'm not defiled Tamar. Like David defiled Beersheba. Absalom arranged by another person, he didn't do it himself, to kill 
Amnon. Like David arranged for Joab to have Uriah killed. David didn't do it himself. The sword was there all the time. Then you need to get continue. Absalom rose up against him and drew the sword against David. If you read the story of David from 1 Samuel chapter 16 and then you go on until 2 Samuel chapter 11. You'll see beautiful, beautiful things from this chapter 12 after the prophet came to him. If you read the story then Absalom drove him from the throne and carried the sword. And even got a his his counselor, on his side. And then David began to run away from the sword of Absalom. And then eventually Absalom was riding upon the mool. Then he came to the thick forest. And the air of Absalom caught on the, on the branches. And then the mool rode off. A saying, it's good to, you know, be free from carrying this rebel. And just went away. And the man was hanging between heaven and earth. Not fit to live on earth and not fit to go to heaven. And somebody came to tell Joab, I saw Absalom. He's hanging there. What did you do? I had when the king said, we well, shouldn't touch him. Don't touch him. And then Joab went there, and then you know the story. Or well, three spears, his life was gone. You know what Nathan said? Because you have done this. Yes, he forgave him. God forgave him. But the things that happened later, read the whole Bible. Don't just read one chapter, don't just read one verse. And then run with that and think that is the end. But the point is this. The prophets of that time, they don't have to go through that long process of discovery. Come to the New Testament. Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, reading from verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, or Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife being also privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie unto the Holy Ghost? He didn't even interview him. He didn't even ask him any question. He didn't have to interrogate him. And use some psychological promptings to make him feel inconvenient and then be watching his eyes and be watching his lips and reading his lips and then using all these methods of interrogation. No interrogation. This is not the time of the apostles. The prophets, they had a different method. It was revealed to them. And the apostles, here they were. And here the man brought the scene. And without any question, then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? And so we understand the discovery, the discovery of the transgressor in Israel. Point number two, the disclosure by the transgressor, transgressor in Israel. In Joshua chapter 7 now from verse 19. Joshua chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 19. Verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. And make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And this Joshua, there's a lot to learn from Joshua. Remember, 36 people had died already. What Achan did had brought real problem on Israel. And then also, the Lord had said, I will not be with Israel anymore. 
Because of what has happened. There is an accursed thing in Israel. And then get up, search, and find out who has done this. Eventually they found Achan. Now look at the language of Joshua to Achan. Joshua said, Achan to Achan, my son, my son, there is no anger in your heart. There is no bitterness in your heart. There is no hatred in your heart. Otherwise, how can, you, how can you get to heaven as a pastor, as an overseer? If people do things in the church that are not all right, and then you have to discipline and you have anger and you have bitterness. You know, there are some people that think that you cannot discipline except you are angry. Some people think you cannot rebuke somebody except you are angry, except you are worked up. And you have bitterness in your heart. Except your frown. You cannot discipline. Why not? You know when I was a teacher in the school. And uh, you know some of those uh, people. Some of those young people. They will not uh, you know, do their assignment. And then I give them some things to do. And then I'm looking through. Number one I said look at this girl. I give zero. I can see me singing and whistling while I give the zero. I mark number two. I say, look at this. I give two over 20. I mark number three. And I give four over 20. I mark number five. And then by the time I add everything up, I have 17 over 100. I'm not hungry. And then I come to the class. And, you know, one of my students, uh, she is now a married woman. She is not a member of our church. I have a lot of them in our church now, but this one is not a member of our church. And uh, so she said, sir, do you remember me? She came to see me at Bagada. And she said, do you remember me? I said, well, looks like I've seen you before. I was your student. I said, yes, I remember now. 19, what did you pass out? 19 is, you know, maybe 58. You taught me. I said, now I remember. Then she said, before I tell you what I come for, let me tell you what you used to tell me. And then she said, you will say, don't worry. This thing is tough for you. Your children will learn it. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give her the 17 percent and then I hand over her paper. I said, look at your paper. Don't worry about it. Your children will learn it. You know, I was, I didn't, you don't have to be hungry. I can give you 17 percent and not be hungry. The same thing in church. You know, you can discipline somebody smiling. Brother, you blew it this time. This is bad. And you're still my son. Joshua said, my son, I pray thee, give glory to God and make confession unto me. There was no anger. You don't have to be angry and lose your soul. You don't have to have hatred for people and lose your soul. The fellow has committed immorality and he needs pity, but you'll still discipline him. I'm sorry for this, my brother. How could you do this? You have been a trusted person. You have been one of the people we are looking up to. If somebody else told me about this, I will not believe. How could you do this? And then you say, we have to act on this. And the fellow is crying. And you even might cry with him. Tears of compassion. And tears of identification of the man. But... You still discipline him. That you cry with him and weep with him. And you say, my son. And you kneel down. You take his son. Kneel down with him and pray with him. Does not mean you will not discipline him. That's the beauty of the Christian ministry. Without anger. But you see people. If they're going to discipline somebody. They have to get angry. Why? Two wrongs will not make a right. This fellow is going on discipline because he went wrong. And then you also went wrong by getting angry. Don't get angry. Just discipline with love. And so Joshua said, my son, 
make the confession, your confession unto him. Tell me now, what thou hast done, hide it not from me. Verse 20, and Achan answered, in verse 20, and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils of a goodly Babylonish garment, and two hundred shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of fifty shekels of weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth, in the midst of my tent, and the silver under it, the disclosure, the disclosure. You know, eventually, he confessed. And sometimes, you know, people have to confess like that. And people will say, since the man confessed now by himself, why don't you just let him off the hook? Why don't you just release him? After all, he has confessed. What else will he do? But brothers and sisters, 36 people have died already. Brothers and sisters, the glory of God is withdrawn already. Yes, he's making confession. But God said, I abandoned the whole nation because of him. And just because he has come at this late hour to now confess... Is that all? Where, what record are we going to put the 36 people that died? And then the glory, the power, the partnership, the presence of God that has led the nation. Where are we going to record that? And the fear that came, the melting of the heart, the discouragement that came to the heart of the whole nation. Where are we going to record that? And at this event that happened, what, because of what Achan did, Joshua could not eat. Joshua could not plan. He fell on the ground with all the elders of the nation. Is Achan just going to say, uh, when Joshua said, my son, yes, you are my father, good daddy, sugar daddy. This is what I did. And because I confess now, you overlook what I've done and you preserve me even though I was instrumental to the death of 36 people. You have to balance the equation. Yes, he made a disclosure. Yes, he made a confession. But the Lord had said, there is something to do. In 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're looking at verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. Eventually he confessed, but too late. Eventually he confessed, but too late. But you know, before this time, Almighty God had sorrow in the eyes. He said, I regret, I repent that I made Saul a king. And then Samuel prayed all the night in sorrow. And now a soul is coming at this late hour. I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord. Why did you wait until this time, Saul? Why didn't you say that at the beginning? Why all the argument and all the excuses? Don't you know actions are waged by the Lord? And now he's saying in that verse 24, I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord. And I was because I feared the people. Didn't I tell you? He, he, he leaned towards the people. It was people-oriented man. It wasn't doctrine-oriented, commandment-oriented. It wasn't God-oriented. It wasn't oriented to the glory of God. Just the people. I feared the people and obeyed their voice. And then in verse 28, And Samuel said unto him, The Lord has rent, torn, taken 
the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and he has given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Verse 30. In verse 30, it says, Then he said, I have sinned. I have sinned. Yet, honor me now. Can you say that? I'm still king. Respect my position. The ego, the pride. Samuel, privately here, let me talk to you. Please come, come near. Don't allow my subordinates to know. Let's preserve my respect, my honor. Honor me before the people. Come, let me tell you privately, I accept. I have sinned privately. But honor me before the people now. And you see why that man was not really forgiven? And the Lord is telling us, although you make a disclosure, do it at the right time. If it's too late, it will affect the attitude or the response or the reaction of God to that confession. If you'll confess at the right time, that will be all right. But if you allow the glory of God to be lost, the favor of God to be lost, and the power of God in our midst to be lost, and a lot of other things to happen, and other people to backslide through your action. You know, somebody does something, and then it has influenced a lot of other people, and then you have had about 50, 100 people backsliding, that he brought so and so can do that, and maybe it's not known to his pastor yet. But the people are seeing that, and they say, Pastor so, brother so and so can do that. Who are we? Maybe this education they are talking about is not possible. Maybe this holiness is not possible. And then when temptation comes, instead of resisting temptation, they already have an influence, an example of brother so and so that they know very well. And many people are backsliding and, and going back because of him. And then at a late hour, after many lives have been destroyed, he now comes dragging his feet. Pastor, I wanted to tell you something. I didn't have courage to tell you. Actually, this happened and that happened. Why did you wait until that time? Because many lives have been affected negatively. Before you eventually summon up the courage to come. Other people have left the church because they saw the hypocrisy of your life. Other people don't believe in God anymore. They say, no, it's all preaching. Nobody can do it. So and so preaches forcefully to you and effectively. But we know what he does. It's one of their key leaders over there. Me, I'm not going to punish him myself and trying to live a holy, holy life when these people are not able to do it. Many people are backsliding already. And now, after watch, after others have, have gone, then you come and say, yes, I've, I've not done right. And you go to a place, a prayer meeting. You're a leader, you're a coordinator, a group coordinator. Maybe you're an overseer. Your wife is having a challenge. Maybe there's no child yet. And then you hear, there's a place where they're rubbing ointment on the belly of a woman and then they'll have children. And then you look here and there. And because you didn't see any member of the church, you went there with your wife. And you did quite a lot of things for you there. And they made all the potions and all the liquid, everything, what you are drinking. And you are drinking that privately. But the herbalist there, and the woman there rubbing their belly asked you of your name. And you don't know. Maybe she came to retreat before. But she wasn't converted. She continued her trade of tradition. And then said, is this not one of those people? They are pastor there. And then eventually when other people come, he is going to use you as publicity material. And it's going to say, uh, you people, be deceiving yourself. So and so. You know him? This is his name. 
Do you know that his wife does not have a child? Yes, I know that. Okay. I'm the one helping them. Myself. That wife. I kept that wife here for three days, rubbing her belly. Then the member of the church will want, and then they'll be transferring that to other people. Don't stay on faith clinic only. Oh. Don't stay on crusade power only. So and so is going to see such and such. And then they take them away. And after about 50 people in the church have gone there. And then maybe we hear a report. We then call you. Then you say, at last, pastor, truly. Uh, I don't know why I yielded to the devil like that. But I've repented. I've repented. Pastor, I'm sorry. It's only I didn't have courage to come and tell you. And then what you expect is, the pastor will say, okay, don't do that anymore. Let's keep this standard. But no. The pastor said, leave what you are doing. Why? But I've confessed now. And I've repented. And God has forgiven me. How about the members of the church? Who have been derailed. And they have gone there. On what account do we put that? That's the problem. It's not just confession. It's not just to say, I've repented. Think before you do it. Because it has consequence. I pray the Lord will help us. The disclosure by the transgressor. We're told in Job chapter 34. Job chapter 34. We're reading from verse 21. Job 34 verse 21. For his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. God sees everything. God knows everything. His eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. There is no darkness, no shadow of death, where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Point number three, the discipline of the troubler of Israel. The discipline of the troubler of Israel. We come to Joshua chapter 7. Joshua chapter 7. Before I read the discipline to what they actually did, let me show you what God said they ought to do. Look at verse 15. Chapter 7, verse 15. It shall be that he that is taken with their cursed sin shall be burnt with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has wrought folly in Israel. That's what God said to Joshua. Now you all understand what Joshua did then. You cannot blame Joshua. This is what God commanded him to do. And many times you cannot blame the leadership of the church. If the word of God is clear as to what to do. And we can read it in the black and white of the scripture. That when this happens. This is what to do. Our hands are tied. We don't have any choice. This is what the Lord said should be done. And then when we do it, you'll not be blaming us. Why are they acting like that? You cannot ask us. Ask God. This is what God said. You will discover the man. And when you discover the man, you'll burn him and burn up all that he has. And then you will take the anger of the Lord, the fury of the Lord, away from the land of Israel. Now you will not blame Joshua. Even though he talked nicely to Achan. That's his personal life. Personal relationship. Personal interaction. Fellowship. We have to do that. But the edge, we have to go back to the Bible. And then we have to carry out exactly what the Bible had said. Joshua now chapter 7 verse 24. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan. With Achan, the son of Zeba, Zerah, and the silver, 
and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen. Why? His sons and his daughters. The sons and the daughters, they saw when he brought all those things back home. And the sons and the daughters welcomed him. Daddy, where did you get this? Shh, don't talk. Bring me that shovel. Dig this place. We need to hide this thing. Boy, why are you sitting down there? Bring the shovel and dig here. We need to hide this thing. And the sons and the daughters, they knew about it. And they hid everything together. And they were of age. Age of accountability. Of age to know. What daddy has brought home is their concert thing. And they all kept quiet. They must not tell the secret. And therefore the punishment, the discipline came upon him. And the sons and the daughters. And they were told... And his oxen, his asses, his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had. And he brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why has thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. It's not me, it's the Lord. This is what the Lord said to do, Achan. And we have no choice. We have to carry out the word of the Lord. The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones. And burnt them with fire. After they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones. Unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. The Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. And that shows us something. Discipline is the will of God. When somebody has done wrong, rebuke is the will of God. And when you bring discipline like that, don't go beyond the word of God. Don't add to the word. Don't subtract from the word. Just do what the Lord has said to do and stop there. But do exactly what the Lord had said. And then the anger of the Lord, the fury of the Lord, will turn away from you and your family and the church. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 20. Them that sin, rebuke before all, that others also may fear. That's what the word says. We have no choice. You know, sometimes when somebody has done a scandalous thing, a terrible thing, then people will tell us that, uh, let's be careful now. If you make this man, he's been a leader. If you make him to stand up and say in front of everybody Sunday morning that this is what I've done. Maybe it's adultery. Maybe it's fornication. Maybe it's immorality, one way or the other. If you make him to stand up and say what he has done before everybody, there are new converts there. Will it not destroy the new converts? This is what God said we should do. There may be people who are not members of the church. Who are there that morning. If we just make the mind to stand up. Will not the outsider. Who are in the church. That time. Will they not hear. Well they will hear. This is what God said we should do. We have no choice. Joshua had no choice. This is what God said. He should do. You see in pastoral ministry. There are things we do. It's not that we enjoy them. We don't enjoy them. Somebody you love very much. And then he comes to you. And then he says, Pastor, the Lord had been troubling my mind. I've been keeping for a long time. But this is what I did. You cannot say privately because you love him. And because of the sentiments you have for him. All right. Have you told any other person? No, I've not told any other person. Okay, keep your mouth shut. 
I about my ministry, where I'm walking? Well, if I remove you from there, people will be asking questions. But stay there. Don't be too active. Let's have the discipline methodically. So that you are there. And people can think whatever they want to think. They might think you are resting. They might think you are on leave. They might think you are on vacation. They might think you are trying to delegate. They might think you are trying to help other people to come up. Just stay in their midst. Don't be very active. And, uh, you know, just say, you do this, you do this, but don't be active. Don't say anything to anybody. And then you go to God, you say, I have disciplined him. You didn't discipline him. It says, them that sin, rebuke before all. Don't get angry, but do it. Love them, but do it. Be praying for them, but do it. If they have any financial need or any problem, help them. You're not fighting. The pastor and his members is like a father and the children. You don't talk about a father and a child fighting. You have your children at home. If any of your children did something wrong and they said, hey, come on here. Leave nothing you are doing. Come here. I heard this is what you did. You love your child. You don't want him to grow up in that kind of wayward attitude and go to prison later. It's love. You did this. You did this. All right. I'm going to deny you of this. Then the other children, if they came and they said, Daddy, why are you fighting with Samuel? You say, children, this is not fighting. Daddy and child do not fight. But daddy can discipline the child. And therefore, when some, sometimes in, in a church, when the pastor is trying to correct something, and the pastor is firm, and the pastor is saying, no, you can't do that here. And then he sends them on discipline. Then they say, the pastor and so and so are fighting. No, that's not fight. That's discipline. And we do that every time. And we need to, are these not leaders? This is a leadership congress. And we need to understand that. You know, somebody says, there is cold war between the leader and those people what do you mean by cold war is there a war god said i will withdraw and he said until they seek me they will not find my face are you going to say god is having cold war with the children of israel it's discipline discipline takes many forms and it is when the people realize that God is not happy with them. Because he withdraws his presence, his power, his glory from them. And they realize that, that then they will turn to the Lord and they will seek the Lord. That's what discipline is supposed to do. But if you, if you are you know, going to those members of the church and you are saying well take heart it will soon be over we're seeing what is happening we know that the leader is having cold war with you you are the one that makes them long to stay long in that kind of situation it's discipline cold war is discipline withdrawal of favor and withdrawal of fellowship is discipline we discipline our children in various ways at home. As you look at the word of God, uh, look at this in Hosea chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5. In verse, uh, in verse 15. Hosea chapter 5 verse 15. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. That's discipline. I leave them to themselves. My favor will not be with them. My power will not be with them. My presence will not be with them. I will go. 
and return to my place till they acknowledge their affairs and seek my face in the affliction they will seek me early and so then we understand that there's discipline and now after the discipline the favor of god will come back the favor of god will come back unto us in joshua chapter 7 joshua chapter 7 the middle of verse 26 so the lord turned from his fierce anger god is a good god i said god is a good god you know all he wants is for us to repent and turn away from all that we have done that offends him and once we turn immediately immediately that's another thing we need to learn you know sometimes there are people that their leaders after the discipline and the fellow is sober and the fellow is serious and the fellow is repentant they say all right i'm not in the mood now what are you going to be in the mood there shall be love and forgiveness and mercy and compassion and then you reconnect again and you do your work it's like father and children at home the child has done something wrong and then you are firm you are very clear you cannot do this in this family and then the child tried to you know play the tricks of teenagers and then the child saw that you are not bulging you are not changing and then he says daddy i'm sorry won't you forgive me the way you've been taking care of me it's like i mistook you know your love for weakness now i'm sorry he said that's all right my daughter everything is over you forgive learn to forgive learn to be compassionate and then everything that you withdrew before you give up everything again and god said that's all right i turn towards you and everything that i gave you before all the promises we read about from joshua chapter one all the promises are back again but until the time you take their accursed sin away they'll not come back but once you take their accursed sin away the favor of god will come back the mercy of God will come back. The love of God, the joy of the Lord will come back. And you don't remember that again. And you don't, if something else happened later, you're not referred to that again. That one is gone. That water is gone under the bridge. This is a new day. If a new thing happens, deal with that new thing. Don't be, it shouldn't be a catalog of things that we are saying, but I about this, I about that. But thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his love. Thank God for his promises. Those promises are yes and amen as we turn to the Lord. If he be willing and obedient, he shall eat the good of the land. But if he refuse and rebel, then thou shalt be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. We have the choice. If things are wrong, let's get them corrected so that the favor of God can come back to our lives. Let's rise up and pray. Let's talk to the Lord, the recovery and the restoration to divine favor. Recovery and restoration to divine favor. Talk to the Lord. Don't act tired. Don't sleep. Repentance will bring divine favor. Humility will bring divine favor. Having a new heart, a new spirit will bring divine favor. A new attitude, new behavior will bring divine favor humility submission to the word to the will of god will bring divine favor pledging your allegiance and pledging your obedience to the lord and to your leader to joshua will bring divine favor getting rid of the accursed sin in our heart in our lives in our mind that will bring divine favor. Having a proper understanding of the demands of the Lord, the requirements of the Lord, 
and acting according to that word according to that requirement of the lord it will bring divine favor you don't want to do christian work and christian ministry or psychological sentiment want to do the work of God according to the word of God when there is sin it has to be dealt with and the repentance will be real visible, seen not a kind of temporary repentance partial repentance outward repentance but a bad evil accursed thing is still in the heart still hidden under the tent for leaders and pastors and overseers this is what reveals that you're a real minister where you can rebuke sin, deal with sin in the congregation, among the members and among the workers. And you are not just teaching effectively, you are enforcing the word effectively. Would you renew the commitment to the call of God in your life then? And say, Lord, I remain committed to your word. You know what to do. You know how to do it. Get pride out of the way. Be humble in the sight of the Lord. And submit to the word of God. When you came to the church, that was a consecration. Lord, I submit to your word. I consecrate myself to your word. Don't get so proud because of your area of ministry. As if you are now equal to your father. At the same level with your father. And if there's any problem, I'll see if you and your father are fighting. No. That cannot happen. Your father can discipline you. That's not fighting. And if you're a real son, a real daughter, You understand? When your pastor is not happy with you. You understand? When the favor is withdrawn from you. And you do the right thing. And you call upon the Lord. And you do right. And if others who are not sons in the ministry. If they come to talk to you. To teach you, influence you against your father. You know that those are strangers. That's what cult members do. Cult members will train their members to assault their father, their mother. You will encourage them. Give them boldness. And say when you do it, when you assault your daddy, you will grow wings. So be bold. If you can do it to your daddy, you can do it anywhere. That's how they train the culture members. To show disrespect, dishonor, to insult, to assault their parents. And then when they've done that, 
They can go any other place and insult, assault any other person. If anybody is teaching you to do that in the church, training you how to insult and assault your father, that's called. And then your allegiance is to that cult rather than to the word of God, to the Bible. But if you turn around and you repent and say, Lord, no more, I will serve you. Then the favor will come. Then the forgiveness will come. Then the promises of God will be yes and amen once again. If a mansion spare your side in that land beyond the sky, after time with you has passed away, faith and duty both will cry just obey, just obey, just obey, just obey. Is the way God's way. When his message comes to you, there is but one thing to do. Just obey. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight. We bless your name. Your word is always bringing light to our hearts, to our conscience. We're enlightened tonight. We're inspired tonight. Now we see the way back to the fullness of the favor of God tonight. Oh Lord, we pray this way will take it in Jesus' name. Will not dig up even our broken cisterns that can hold no water for ourselves. This is the fountain of truth. And you have revealed this truth unto us. And this refreshing water coming out of the fountain. When we drink, we're going to have refreshing and satisfaction. Satisfy us more and more with this water of life in Jesus' name. Cleanse us. Wash us. Purify us. Purge us. Make our lives different and transformed in Jesus' name. Now, those of us here who are real leaders, pastors, overseers, give us courage. That when the time comes, not every day, not even every week, might not even be every month, once in a while, when the, when the situation arises, that we need to rise up and say, this is the way, what key they are in. Knowing what you have called us to do to take people to heaven. Lord, we pray when we need courage, conviction, boldness to discipline in the church. Help us to do it. To do it with love. To do it with a kind heart. To do it with a good purpose of making people to toe the line of the word of God. And to get ready for heaven. Help us, Lord, not to do anything in anger, anything in bitterness, and not to, not to hate people, and not to just disqualify people forever and forever, whatever they do, even if they repent, that we're never going to yield or bulge. That's not the way of the Lord. Give us the heart of Christ, the mind of Christ, that, Lord, any correction, any rebuke, any discipline will be moderated to just the level of the commandments of the Lord. And, Lord, help us to know there's also New Testament, not Old Testament. In the Old Testament, things were, uh, things were very, very drastic. But thank you, Lord, because of your grace and your mercy, because of your love and your kindness. Jesus died for us on the cross of Calvary. 
And he doesn't want any of us to perish. And Lord, help us as pastors and leaders that when we correct people, when we rebuke people, when we deceive people, it will not make people so discouraged that uh, they are lost, they will not be lost. We we'll pray, Lord, that all our brothers and sisters who are here, eventually, will get to heaven together. Whatever has happened in the past, Lord, a merciful God, a kind God, a loving God. And Lord, as you grant your people the heart to just say, I'm sorry, and everything is over, I pray that your favor will be multiplied in every life in Jesus' name. Bless all our brothers. Bless all our sisters. Bless all the families who are here. And help us, Lord, to have the favor, the divine dew of heaven upon everybody here in Jesus' name. Bring comfort to every heart. Bring joy to every life. And Lord, I pray everything we have learned here will bear fruit in everyone. All our ministries, whatever section of ministry we're in, oh Lord, after you've corrected us and we say, Lord, we're sorry, you are a father, a great father, a loving father. I pray, Lord, everybody will be fruitful in ministry in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray.